ability to connect things together. Now, we all know that there are challenges in this space, right? Because if you cannot get a cell phone signal, it's a little hard to make the Internet of Things work. But here's what's really interesting. I'm working with two companies right now. There's a satellite company that has developed a base station that for about $10,000 is about the size of that TV. You can set it anywhere in the world and it will throw data to the cloud and pull it back down. And another company that's building a remote fencing concept to secure remote assets mostly for the military where we can put a remote fence around a military asset anywhere in the world using the satellite dish that I just described, we can know instantaneously when anything violates that fence. We will know whether an elk walks through that line or a person. Instantaneously. Now, I don't, you know, I mean the military thing is pretty fascinating. And if I've got to secure, you know, remote assets in the oil business, that's even more fascinating. But I'm really interested in knowing which of my gates are open from Nebraska. So I can just call the manager and say, actually, it would be better if I won't have to call him because he'll already know. Right? That could be cool. That's the kind of thing that the Internet of Things can potentially do. Where do I think autonomous vehicles have the most sense in farming application? Not in cities so much, right? Because it's, it's only going to take the attorneys about 15 minutes to shut that thing down. Once one thing goes wrong, that industry is dead. But a grain cart that moves in synchrony with my combine, that's cool. Though, can it be done? Yes, I've seen it work in Iowa. There's a company out there that's built one. It works. It works. And it works in real geography. Right? It's pretty cool. Augmented reality. Right? Um, this ability to pull into a visceral space, information from the virtual world instantaneously, right? The day will come that you won't have to carry around a catalog. James will hand you a set of Google glasses, you'll look at a bull, and above the bull will appear all of the EPDs. We're not that far away, right? Now, I don't know how the heck it's going to work with my trifocals, so I'm hopeful it's going to work. <laughs> right? But that's kind of cool. John Deere and Syngenta and all those cats thinking about it already. The one I love being mechanically um, challenged, augmented reality so that I can have a mechanic show me what the heck I'm supposed to do when I'm out there on my own. Because today when I go back to the ranch, this is how I'm treated. Please don't touch that. <laughs> right? Maybe with augmented reality, I'll get a fighting chance to use the equipment. This is another big one for us. This is a big one. Next generation. This is a big deal. This is, this is important to the whole country in ways that I don't think we've really recognized yet. Now we talk about this all the time. This, this aging farmer, but it's a very real phenomena. Two times more farmers over 65 than under 45. I put this together for farm credit. Uh, I did some work with them last year and, and, and I put this together to make the point to their boards, more than half of your clients, if you're a farm credit organization, will exit the business by 2030. 50% of your clients are going to exit the business your existing clients, the existing decision maker, your existing board members, right? That's a big deal. So are you building farm credit for guys my age who are going to exit by 2030, or are you building it for her age? Really important. 21% of farms and ranches in this country today do not have a succession plan and no known successor. There's no one actually to take the reins. 21% of existing farms and ranchers, there's nobody to take the reins. That's scary. Like if from a food security perspective, that scares me a lot. 60% of the 
of agricultural land will change hands by 2040. The Louisiana Purchase is about to re-transfer. Essentially what that means. Everything that Lewis and Clark looked at is going to change hands. So that means those of us who are a little grayer have some serious work to do. We got to get around the table. And we got to get around the table with the next generation, and we have to bring to that table everybody. Everybody. What percent of farms, what percent of all farmer or farm ownership, what percent of all farmers, and what percent of professional ag business positions today are held by women in the United States? What percent of farm ownership, all farmers, and professional agribusiness positions? 80% Less than 1%. Well, I said 80% of the farms. 80% of the farms, because the guys die, exactly. right? Okay. Any other guesses? 50%. Okay. We've got a good range here. Yeah. One to almost 100, right? Uh, based on Casey Cohen Isom's work, right, big uh, uh, accounting firm that does a lot of work with large farms in the country, they say one third. Now, many of you know who Paul Angler is, okay? Uh, uh, we've been so fortunate to have Paul Angler uh, uh, build the program that we have at the University of Nebraska. We're grateful for that at an unbelievable level. I listened to him very carefully. And a year ago at our board meeting, he said, understand this much. He looked right at me, he shook his finger at me because when he wants me to do something, that's how he does it. He says, do you understand this is the century of the woman? Yes, sir. I do understand that. We all need to understand that. We have got to bring, so let me ask a question. Who all here has a daughter or a granddaughter? Raise your hands. Okay, are your daughters and your granddaughters smart and capable? Okay, so you're to blame. So now we know who to blame, right? You raised a whole generation of smart, capable people. Who to give the credit to, not to blame. Right, who to give the credit to. There you go, yes, turn that around. Thank you very much. Right, who to give the credit to, because here's the reality. We can no longer play with half of our team on the bench. We cannot. We need a whole generation of smart, powerful women and smart, powerful men in agriculture. And we need to be in harmony on it, not in disharmony like the rest of the world. Right? People will ask me, so what's the value of the Angler program? And, and I don't say this very often, um, but because it's, people sometimes view it as politically incorrect, but I say, look, our number one job is to create the most powerful marriages in the history of Nebraska. That's our job. Because if that happens, we'll produce a complete generation of new business owners who will build companies for the right reasons in communities where they'll make a difference. So I'm a big fan of this, right? New markets. Okay, let's move to new markets real quick. Look. In a perfectly efficient market, there is one player who owns the marketplace, right? Here's the really good news. There are very few efficient markets. So where are the opportunities? The opportunities are in new markets where demand exceeds supply. And there are all kinds of emerging things in that space today. Uh, I just got off the phone earlier today. There's an attorney in Omaha who's a retired guy, and he's part of a big family firm and, and he's no longer the chairman so he's got time on his hands and his new vision is, is you know he says we got to form this marketing company to help uh, farmers who get involved in this hydroponic and tower farming he goes we need to figure that out uh, cool that's a good idea right that's a new market fragmented markets no clear leader and then stagnant markets, that's where you can do disruption, right? The taxi business was stagnant. That's why Uber was successful there. Let's just think about those fragmented markets. The food market is the most fragmented of all. Look, 
Walmart's the big player. We all know that. They're the gorilla in the room, but they only have about 17 or 